What I'm going to talk about in the next few minutes is, is some of the new things that are out there for the treatment of, of male urinary incontinence post-prostatectomy predominantly. We all know that, that uh, if you do robotic prostatectomy, none of your patients are incontinent, but the ones that come from a, uh, the other side of town are often incontinent. <laughs> so you have to be able to deal with those, those, those patients. So we're going to talk a little bit about, about the AUS, about its history, about uh, what new things are on the horizon for the AUS, and some of the newer, newer devices that are out there being investigated around the world. And there are a number of new, new uh, both compressive as well as sphincter type devices that are being, being looked at in a variety of, a variety of places. Well, we know that, that, uh, that, that the actual guidelines for treatment of, of male urinary incontinence after prostatectomy are really few and far between. This is one from the sixth uh, international consultation on incontinence. And basically the bottom line was is that they said that, for the, that the gold standard for patients with or men with moderate to severe stress urinary incontinence after radical prostatectomy is the artificial urinary sphincter. For patients with, with uh, mild to moderate, some, some moderate, um, the, the slings are acceptable. The definition of moderate is controversial, and really that's up to the, the eye of the, of the beholder. Injectable agents have poor success. I think we all know that uh, is, is true with patients post-radical prostatectomy. And then uh, there are a number of, of discussions in the last bullet point about options for treatment of patients that fail the artificial urinary sphincter uh, to uh, include downsizing the cuff, tandem cuffs, uh, increasing pressure, et cetera, but really no, no major uh, agreement as to what, what that should be. The Interna International Continent Society in 2015 also had a con consensus statement about the treatment of these patients and basically suggested that uh, there should be a preoperative assessment, there should be, uh, there should be uh, uh, urodynamics, there should be cystoscopy to evaluate the, the urethra, and uh, there should be, there should be uh, obviously, discussion of patients with, uh, discussion of, of outcomes with patients as far as, uh, as, far as success rates and, 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 and possible complications and failures. Here's the, this is the, this from the same, uh, the same group, the, they also suggested that new artificial urinary sphincters should be developed or should be considered, and the ideal artificial urinary sphincter should be easily manipulated and activated. It uh, should be modified cuff pressure to, uh, to, decrease, uh, to, to decrease erosion, should be able to be uh, adapted able to adapt the cuff pressures in a real-time manner. We know that patients that do something strenuous, have a strenuous job, uh, pick up something heavy, often leak through the current sphincter. So if one could increase the pressure when the patient does something strenuous, decrease the pressure at night, those would be things that perhaps would, would preserve the, 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 the uh, urethra itself on a, in a, in, uh, for, for more, more success. And I'll show you what the, the ultimate successes of the AUS were uh, in R in, in, uh, in just a moment. It should be cost effective, and that's really the biggest problem. These, these, uh, these, these devices are, are expensive to put in, they're expensive to, to, to buy, and they're certainly expensive when, when, you, when, you, when you put in the, the potential complications. And these are some of the causes of revision surgery, and, and, the, and, and we know that, that uh, the revision surgery is, 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 occurs in 10 years in about 70% of patients that have artificial urinary sphincters. So it's a, it's, a common, it's a common thing for those of us that put in artificial urinary sphincters. There's often, uh, there's often uh, uh, problems with the reservoir, problems with pressure, discomfort at the pump site, uh, accessibility of the scrotal pump is often difficult for, for especially older patients. We discussed that a little bit yesterday. I think, uh, I think uh, there's some good information about what happens in the, in the man who gets a, an artificial urinary sphincter at age 65 and then at age 80 he, he, can't, uh, he can't manipulate the device any longer. He's confined to a nursing home and he, now he has this device that increases the, the challenge of, his, uh, of, of care of his urinary tract itself. Erosion is, is one of the biggest problems and we still see erosion although it's less common than it was uh, in the early days of the artificial urinary sphincter and I'll talk more about that in just a moment. This again is the, the, the consensus conference where they basically said that, that um, the AMS 800 should be offered 
to individuals with stress urinary incontinence who have failed conservative management within six months of their radical prostatectomy. And I think that's an important, an important uh, recommendation because most of the patients that I see have been incontinent for two, three, four, or even longer periods of time because they're not referred for an artificial urinary sphincter and they're miserable. Their life is, is totally turned upside down by their terrible incontinence. So if, they, if the patient is completely incontinent or majorly incontinent at six months, they should be offered some treatment alternative and the artificial urinary sphincter continues to be the gold standard. They need to have uh, sufficient manual dexterity and cognitive function to, to have the, the sphincter placed. So what's the history of the artificial urinary sphincter? Well, it was developed by, by, by uh, Bradley Tim and uh, Brantley Scott uh, back in the, in the 1970s. It was first implanted in the, in the early 1970s, around 1973, and uh, it was uh, a, a device that, that was inflate, inflated and it, the patient inflated it to be, to be continent. The more they inflated it, the more pressure there was, and the, the, the risk of erosion in those days was about 30% within, within, uh, within two to three years of the implantation. So it was clearly not a very good device. It was then, uh, it was then redesigned in, in 1982 in the current uh, AMS 800 fashion, which has a uh, deactivation button and also has controlled cuff pressure to decrease the, the erosion, and the erosion rate has fallen substantially since that time from about 30% to less than 5%. Double cuffs were, have been around for about 20 years, and to date there are over 180,000, almost 200,000 implants uh, that, uh, of the artificial urinary sphincter to, to care for patients with, with uh, radical prostatectomy-related incontinence. So this is what some of the older devices look like. You can see that this is the original one, the a AS721, uh, then it became the 742. But these were all ones where you inflated it to become continent and deflated it to, 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 to void, and patients would increase the pressure all the time to be a little more continent, increasing the risk of erosion with, the, with this device. Then the, uh, the current device was, was introduced, as you all are aware, with a controlled pressure balloon and uh, a cuff that, that basically deflates to allow uh, uh, voiding, but it's controlled by the pressure of this balloon and not by the patient. The control pump includes a deactivation button that, again, decreases the, the, the risk of, of erosion and has been a, a great advance as far as, the, as far as success is concerned. The newer ones now contains inhibizone on two out of the three components. There's none on the, on the, on the pressure balloon because it couldn't be applied to the pressure balloon. And uh, there, there's some uh, investigation and some research go uh, ongoing currently to see if there's another way to have a, a, an, an antibiotic or an anti-infective device without, uh, without antibiotic coating. Well, currently there are a number of, of, of implantable options in addition to the AMS that are uh, 800 that are being looked at that are both compressive as well as sphincter uh, related, and th these are some of the ones that, that, are, that are out there, and I'll talk about some of them uh, as, as, we go, as we go along. This is one that's very common and in, in commonly used in South America. It's approved uh, in Eastern Europe in some countries, and it's basically a compression device. It's a cushion that sits underneath the bulbous uh, urethra here, and, it, and there's an inflation port where the physician or the healthcare provider can increase the amount of volume in this, in this, in this cushion underneath the, 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 uh, the, the urethra. So basically this is a, re, a, a, a recapitulation, if you will, of the old Kaufman device. And I always like to use this quote, uh, those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And so if you look at, the, at what happened with the, with, the, with the Kaufman device, and the Kaufman device was exactly the same kind of thing. They started out with a Kaufman 1, then there was a Kaufman 2, and a Kaufman 3, Kaufman 4, Kaufman 4A, and then they stopped. So obviously it didn't work terribly well, and actually one of the first papers I ever published when I, was, when I got to Duke was long-term results of the Kaufman prosthesis. And we had, uh, it, at, in our Duke experience, 100% failure with the Kaufman prosthesis. So the, this is a, a compressive device, very much like the Adams, and I don't know why they think the Adams would be any different from the, from the Kaufman prosthesis, but it's being marketed and being implanted. And you probably will see patients that come from either Europe or South America that may have this device implanted. It's ve being very, very aggressively marketed in those, in those places, but not approved in the U.S. 
So basically, the, again, the gold standard for, for uh, severe urinary, urinary incontinence post prostatectomy is the AUS uh, dub, uh, single cuff or double cuff. Double cuff is less often used today than it was originally. And then the sling for mild to moderate, again, one to two pads per day patients. And uh, as, as you get up to the, the three to five pad uh, per day patients, the sling is very unlikely to, to, uh, to be successful. So I looked at, at, at uh, what, the, what the implant numbers were around the, around the world, thinking that the U.S. was probably going to be the most common implanter of artificial urinary sphincters, but in fact we're not. Here, here we are in, in implants per million men. Actually, France is, is, is much more likely to implant, as is Australia, than, than, than the U.S. So it's, it's interesting that that, uh, that, that, that would, be, would be the case, but certainly we do a lot of these implants uh, in, in the U.S. as well. So the long-term results of, of the artificial urinary sphincter uh, have, have been reported. A re retrospective review of 1,632 AUS patients from, uh, from Canada implanted 1994 to 2013. The 10-year revision rate and was, was about 34 percent. The reimplantation rate about uh, 27 percent. They showed in this group that radiotherapy did not increase the risk of, 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 incre of repeat surgery, and uh, they basically also showed that the, the only factor that they could identify that increased the revision or removal rate was a uh, high comorbidity of, of types other than radiation therapy. What about artificial urinary sphincter in, in, in women? Rarely done in the U.S. Uh, in fact, the indication in the U.S. expired many years ago because of very low adap adaptation. It's commonly, how it, not commonly, but more commonly done in, in France. And here's, a, here's a, a, a paper that was reported about uh, two years ago or a year and a half ago uh, using robotic-assisted placement of the artificial urinary sphincter uh, cuff in the, in the bladder neck of women and with, with stress urinary incontinence that had failed all other things. And basically, they, what they showed in five centers in France, in 40 patients, they showed that their patients were fully continent in 81.6% of the, of, of the cases, improved continence an additional 12.2%, and only 6% remained unchanged. So maybe we should readdress the issue of, of, of the AMS uh, 800 in, in, in women, although uh, th that's uh, more confined to the, to the French practice currently. Here you can see the revision-free survival that was reported in the World Journal of Urology in 2018. And here you can see, if you look out here at 10 years, you can see that only about 30% of the, less than 30% of the patients with artificial urinary sphincters continue to have survival of their, of their device. So 70% of the devices have been, have been either removed, replaced, or there's been some problem with them, so that's really not a very, very good uh, record for the for for survival. Although again, we don't have many alternatives. So there are attempts at, at improving this uh, this outcome, and some of the things that are that are being looked at with the the AMS 800 itself is is uh, inhibizone, as I showed you earlier. A smaller three and a half centimeter cuff has been introduced, but there's currently development underway in Boston Scientific and uh, American Medical Systems to uh, redesign the control pump, redefine and de develop a new activation mechanism, and then change antibiotic surface coatings from inhibizone to something that will in be included on the, on the activation uh, balloon as well as, as the cuff and pump. So there are a number of companies looking at, at new artificial urinary sphincters, electronic and otherwise. One of them is the Zephyr that uh, is available in Eastern Europe. Uh, this is a, a scrotal pump and a, and a, and a, a one-size-fits-all cuff that's pre-connected, pre-filled. It's adjustable through the scrotum by increasing the volume in the scrotum, which increases the pressure on the cuff. Uh, the potential complications are, <clears throat> are, are urethral erosion especially. The early data are not really that great here, 106 patients that were reported in, at, at the ICS in 2018. They had early success, 91.8 percent were dry, but their long-term follow-up of 24 months were really not that great, where 24 patients, or essentially 20 percent of the, of the group, had explantation within, uh, within, within uh, uh, the two-year pe follow-up period, so really uh, mechanical failure and erosion 
were the, were the, were the major complications with erosion occurring in, in 19 of the 106 patients at about a year. So again, that gets us, us back to the old, uh, old uh, AMS device. So uh, the Victo uh, is, is another device that, that's been, been developed. This particular one has two balloons, one that's placed intra-abdominally so that the intra-abdominal pressure will, will increase the pressure on the, on the sphincter cuff as, the, as patients do something strenuous. And again, this has, there are very few uh, uh, publications of, of its, its, uh, its effectiveness but um, the, the continents improved about 61.2% average. This follow-up, however, was only, uh, only about uh, eight months with an average of four to 14 months. Really not enough follow-up to see if, the, if it's effective or if the complications are acceptable or unacceptable. Really the first, uh, the first of the electronic devices is this Artist AUS that, that again is, is, is being investigated in Europe, the, the clinical trial was approved in the Czech Republic in February of 2018. First device was implanted uh, about two years ago. There are no current clinical data available, but it's, a, it's, it's, an, it's an interesting concept in that they have an activation or an actuation device that's implanted along with a, with a cuff, and the cuff, can, can, the cuff pressure can be programmed externally by the healthcare provider, and then the patient inflates and deflates their device with a, with a, with a remote control uh, fob that, that, that they carry around. We've talked a lot about this in some of the developments, and that, there's a real danger to that because the patient can lose it or the, there's no battery in it or there's some problem, and all of a sudden the patient is you know, on an airplane on their way to, 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 the, to the Caribbean islands, and darn, I left that, darn, that the fob on the, on the kitchen counter. So what are you gonna do? So really, one of the real issues with some of these electronic devices is you've got to have a fail-safe mechanism. There's gotta be some way for this to, to, to work without, without having to have a fob that, that is, 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 is variable. So here, here's what the, what the cuff looks like in place. And here's the actuation device that's placed in a, in a fatty area in the abdomen uh, and, and, and concealed with, uh, with uh, a fatty area. Now, I, I know that there's a lot of fat in this patient, so in a very thin patient, that might be a significant problem of finding a place for this relatively large device to, to be placed. So what are some of the other options? Well, there are a number of options that are being investigated, and most of them are proprietary currently and can't be really discussed, but this is a, a paper that was published in the Canadian Journal, uh, in, the, in the Journal of the Canadian uh, Urologic Association, where they looked at what some of the options might be to, to find futuristic alternatives to the AMS 800. And I think this, is, this kind of shadows some of the things that are being, being thought about and investigated currently. So there are several different options. One is, is, is uh, an AUS with a, a, a parallel manual pump. And so I think this, is, this takes care of the fail-safe issue. It allows you to program the pressure of the device, the pressure at the time of day, the, the deflation and inflation. But also, if, if, if all else fails, there's still a pump in, that's placed in the scrotum that the patient can deflate the device if they're stuck without their Without their without their fob or, or their cell phone, one of the concepts was to was to was to activate this and deactivate it by cell phone, which I think is probably not a good idea. I don't know what what your all your, all your practices are, but I have farmers in eastern North Carolina that don't have a cell phone or they still have a flip phone, and there is no possible way that those guys are going to be able to use a cell phone for for their for their artificial urinary sphincter. Another one is a remote controlled. Uh, in parallel again with a with a manual pump, and I think that again this this takes care of some of the issues of of the of the fail safe mechanism. And I think that's that's critically important. Finally, there, there's a, a fully uh, fully remote controlled electronic artificial urinary sphincter, and I think probably that's the way th the the. the progress or the investigation is going to a fully uh, fully electronic uh, and 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 uh, remotely controlled artificial urinary sphincter. And this allows you as a, as a healthcare provider to program this into the patient's needs. So again, the patient at night when he's lying in bed, it can be programmed so there's little or no pressure on the, on the urethra. And then during the day, if he's, if he's doing something strenuous, the pressure can be in, increased to improve the, the continence 
uh, in, in, during the daytime. And, and I, was, I always tell my patients that, you know, when you swing a golf club and hit that 300 yard drive, you're probably gonna leak a little bit. So you could basically program this so that when the patient tees off on the first tee, it go, the pressure goes up and when they're in the 19th hole having a beer, it goes down. So it, 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 it kind of is a perfect thing to customize the, the artificial urinary sphincter to the patient themselves. So basically, if we look at the future of the AMS uh, 800, again, we have, a, we have the, the smaller cuff currently. We also have the, the inhibizone to decrease, to decrease uh, the, the uh, infection risk, although the infection risk for the artificial urinary sphincter is really pretty acceptable, but still, the, the fewer infections, the better. But the things that are currently underway as far as enhancements and changes in the artificial urinary sphincter include redesign of the control pump, perhaps an, a remote uh, control uh, pump with either a fob or some other mechanism for, for, uh, for remotely controlling the pump, actuation me or activation mechanism that can be customized to the individual patient, and then different antibacterial surface coatings to decrease infection risk, different from the, the inhibizone. And those are the things that are currently being investigated and will probably be, some of them, uh, available on the market within the, next, uh, within the next 24 months. So thank you very much.